Hi, I'm Joel Christensen. Welcome to Reading Greek Theater Online with um, from the Center for Hellenic Studies and Out of Chaos Theater. Um, I'm here today with another great cast and special guests. We have for the chorus Danai Epithumiadi, Hecuba is Eunice Roberts, Robert Matney is Talthibius, Evie Miller is Cassandra, for Andromache we have Tabitha Gale, and special guest Robin Mitchell Boyask. We have some uh, dramaturgical guidance from Emma Pauly and our director, Paul O'Mahony can't be here today. Today, we come to you with the play Trojan Women by Euripides. Um, and this play is set in the Trojan War experience after the fall of Troy. Uh, the Greeks lived with tales from the Trojan War myth. Almost 30% of our extant plays in their titles are set there. But I'm often left to wonder what this means. What type of models did the Trojan War provide for their audiences? And what does it mean that they kept going back to these moments? This is especially a major question when it comes to this play. It was performed in 415 BCE, along with the now lost Alexandros and Palamedes. This trilogy was performed in the same year that Athens raised the island of Milos and slaughtered and enslaved its population. In the same year of the disastrous beginning of the disastrous Sicilian expedition. Both of these events are worth mentioning because they feature Athens at the height of its power, aggressive, haughty, and driven by the rhetoric of power. For obvious reasons of context then, Euripides' Trojan women is often read as a response to the same forces, arguing that might makes right in Thucydides' famous Melian dialogue. For me, the outcome of the Melian dialogue, that a democratic people voted to destroy an allied city, kill all the men, enslave all the women and children for the crime of resisting their power, stands with Odysseus's hanging of the enslaved women in the Odyssey and Achilles' sacrifice of Trojan youths over Patroclus' funeral pyre as horrors transmitted by the ancient world that we have all too often minimized or ignored altogether in our reception of the past. So here with Euripides, we have a chance to consider a contemporary, contemporary reaction to ongoing events through the lens of myth on a very public stage. I'm happy to have Robin uh, Mitchell Boyas with us today because he thinks a lot about both the literature and the myth, but also the performances of these tragedies. Robin, can you talk a little bit about what an audience may have seen as the first um, action happened on the stage with this play? Uh, Robin, you're, you're muted if you wanna come on. Very happy to be here. Thank you, Joel. Um, Thank you for being here. Yeah, you know, one of the you know the ancient theater experience was was so different than ours. Uh, just starting with the whole scale of the theater, and of course, operating in broad daylight as opposed to uh, after dinner and a couple of drinks with a the proscenium theater. And for us, when when the play starts, is a very obvious thing, right? It's it's when the guy comes over the loudspeaker and asks us to turn off our cell phones. Uh, and then the uh, then the auditorium goes dark, and then the light comes up on stage. But but for um, if you're if you're working in an open air theater um, uh, with no curtain and no ability to darken anything, when does the play actually start? So the first thing they're going to see probably is uh, the act the actor who's playing Hecuba uh, come out, and whether the actor comes out in in character or not um, is subject to debate. Is is does the, does the actor come out kind of crawling into the acting area? Uh, is he carried out by um, fellow uh, captive women? Um, my guess is the actor probably would start in character. The alternative course is for the actor to walk out and then to lie on the ground. We know that the actor is there because Poseidon in his first speech says, hey, look, down there, there's, there's, there's Hecuba. Um, where the gods are at the beginning. We've got a, an interesting prologue with not one, but two gods. It's not unusual, certainly, for a Euripidean play to start with a god, but the presence of two uh, is a little bit unusual. It's also there in the Alcestis. Um, so where the gods are, they could be one of two places. Either they're down there in the acting area or they're up above, either on the Mekane, the, the crane which would swing suddenly into view, or they're simply standing on top of what is what is probably representing the city walls of Troy. I tend to be really into thinking verticality when it, especially when it, when, when you're talking about power relations. So I would I would tend to think that they're 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 up on high and they're looking down at the mortals whose lives are not worth very much to them. 
even if they are pitting them a bit. Gods tend not to pity in great tragedy, and they certainly don't here. Thank you, Robin. I, I really like the fact that you emphasize the verticality of it, um, because the ancient theater is a very steep set of uh, bleachers, for lack of a better word, right? Um, and so the people in the, the cheap seats um, would have a better view of the gods even than Hecuba down in the orche orchestra. Um, so this play, it starts like many Euripidean plays with Poseidon. He arrives and he laments the fall of Troy. And uh, he laments Troy because it's a city whose walls he built with Apollo. And he blames a particular Hera and Athena. So to be in Athens blaming Athena for the sponsorship of a war seems like a strange thing. And he pointedly ends the first part of his speech by saying, goodbye city to Troy, of course, you would sit on your foundation still if Zeus's daughter Pallas had not destroyed you. Now Athena comes on stage too and she teams up with Poseidon to punish the Achaeans for misbehaving in their destruction of Troy. Poseidon agrees to destroy the Greek fleet, yet the play unfolds before this promised retribution and it's occupied almost entirely by the distribution of the women as prizes to the victorious Achaeans. And as Robin said, um, we see Hecuba first. Lift your head, unhappy one, from the ground. Raise up your neck, this is Troy no more, no longer am I queen in Ilion. Though fortune change, endure your lot. Sail with the stream and follow fortune's tack. Do not steer your ship of life against the tide, since chance must guide your course. Ah me, ah me. What else but tears is now my hapless lot, whose country, children, husband, all are lost. Ah, the high-blown pride of ancestors, humbled, are brought to nothing after all. What woe must I suppress, or what declare? What dirge shall I awake? Ah, woe is me. The anguished way I recline, stretched here upon this hard bed. Oh, my head, my temples my side how i long to turn over and lie now on this now on that to rest my back and spine while ceaselessly my tearful wail ascends this too is a song for those in misfortune for singing disasters that cannot be expressed with song and dance you swift proud ships Rode to sacred Ilion over the deep dark sea, past the fair heavens of Hellas, to the flute's ill omened music and the dulcet voice of pipes, to the bays of Troy, alas, where you tied your horses, twisted handiwork from Egypt in quest of that hateful wife of Menelaus, who brought disgrace on Castor and on Eurytus foul reproach, who murdered Priam the father of 50 children, the cause why I, the unhappy Hecuba, have wrecked my life upon this disastrous strand. Oh, that I should sit here over against the tent of Agamemnon. As a slave, I am led away from my home, a lamenting old woman, while from my head, the hair is piteously shorn for grief. Ah, unhappy wives of those armoured sons of Troy. Ah, poor maidens, luckless brides, come weep, for Ilion is now a smouldering ruin, and I, like some mother bird that over her fledgling screams, will begin the strain. Not the same as that I once sang to the gods as I leaned on Priam's staff and beat with my foot in Phrygian time to lead the dance. So after this speech, Hecuba and the chorus join in what we could consider a type of antiphonal song of mourning, mourning Troy and the dead, um, as they begin to contemplate which woman will be given to which Greek. Um, now, it maybe it seems strange that such deep and emotional material is put into song, but this happens in opera all the time. And I think one of the hardest things about translating Greek tragedy into the modern world is understanding how important the music and singing was. Robin, um, how do you describe this type of song when you're teaching it or writing about it? Uh, mainly in terms of the emotional register. 
Um, we've gone from two gods speaking in the standard spoken iambic trimeter uh, in the prologue, which, which of course can be used to express emotion itself just by modulating your voice. But but yeah, Robert, would you could you uh, indulge us with this just a little iambic trimeter for audience members who I might not be familiar with? Okay, iambic trimeter it's it, it's fairly similar to iambic pentameter of Shakespeare. It, it's it's of all the Greek poetic meters, the one that's closest uh, to, to to human speech. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry. I got technical. Uh, lost my train of thought now. Um, uh, anyway, so so the, so the emotional register uh, of, of a song introduction, especially with its content, uh, is is going to be fairly intense. All right, it's going to be fair, fairly pitched. And what's really extraordinary about about this this kind of first episode is is the way that the the initial monody, the initial solo song by Hakiba, is gets then interwoven with the chorus's entrance song. Uh, most people think that you have basically two half choruses emerge from two huts either side of the central um, um, gate opening uh, of the skene of the stage building, uh, and then they then kind of interweave their um, their songs, their choral songs, with Hecuba's solo singing. And it must have been quite extraordinary to hear. We know that Euripides was was quite interested in um, in in developing and in renovating um, Greek music and often incorporating. Uh, more kind of Eastern styles into his singing, which were considered to be more emotional. Uh, so that could have been at work here as well. So um, can you situate us, situate us just a little more in sort of the performance of this play? Do you think it was the first of the trilogy in the middle, maybe the last? The, the third, and can I just say one more thing about singing? Yeah. Uh, just one really one quick thing, thing about singing is that there's an extraordinary amount of singing in this play. I mean, I, I, I meant to, to count up lines, I didn't have quite time to do this, but I would bet that if you took all of the, the um, surviving great tragedies, this would definitely be in the top 10th, per, top 10th percentile of, of in terms of um, sheer amount of lines devoted to characters singing. And who and who doesn't sing in this play is something we'll, we can maybe talk about a little bit later on. Okay, so um, uh, in terms of the trilogy, um, this, this is, we know more about this year of production for Euripides than we probably do for any other uh, year of Euripides' career. Um, he wrote a very, very unusual, usually for him, a, a, a trilogy with, of course, a satyr play at the end, which were all connected. They weren't connected in the way Aeschylus' Oresteia was connected, where the Oresteia, you have basically a single, huge, overarching plot from the opening lines of Agamemnon to the final lines of the Eumenides. Whereas here you had three, basically, episodes in the, in the myth of the Trojan War. The first one, the play is called Alexandros, which is about um, how uh, Alex Alexandros, that is Paris, is that the other name for Paris, is discovered after roughly 20 years after his exposure because of a prophecy um, that he, his birth would bring uh, a fiery destruction to Troy. He is saved just like Oedipus miraculously on a mountainside, raised, raised by shepherds and returns um, as a young adult male to kind of, uh, because everybody's pissed off at him because he's he's acting basically above his station. So while he's there, he competes in, game, in funeral games for himself because his mother Hecuba uh, has, um, has uh, instituted funeral games because she feels guilty about having had her baby exposed. And of course he winds up getting recognized and even though Cassandra is screaming at them, don't, don't, <laughs> don't let him in, don't let him in, he's going to destroy the city. Of course, she's not, uh, they, they don't really believe her there. And so um, in a way that what seems to have been a major a theme of the entire set of plays is bad choices, right? The Tro the Tro even, you know, even in the Iliad, the Trojans are, are, are basically depicted as a people who make phenomenally bad choices. Uh, so the bad choice you see represented first is Hecuba wanting to get Paris back as her son, right? Reintegrating him into the community when all the signs are is, is a really, really bad idea. No, I mean, if you're going to get to that end point of the Trojan women, right, and these strong resonances with um, current events, especially the raising of Milos, um, why in particular do you think those bad choice moments would be the ones you would select along the way? Uh, well, I, I, I'm, I'm very, I want to be very cautious about the direct connection with Melos because the play would have been in production before 
The play would have been approved by the Archon the previous year before the siege began. It's just the Athenians and the Spartans both had a, had a habit of doing stuff like that. The, the Melian episode was probably the worst and most notorious of them, but, but this has been happening since the beginning of the war. Yeah. Um, so while, while it sounds like a great idea just to see this plays as a specific response to, to the destruction of Milos, it's, it doesn't work chronologically. Okay. Uh, and work. I, I mean, you know, and you've probably taught it before as well. I mean, the Mytilenean affair it, right, that, that's that's definitely that, applicable. Right. Yeah. And for those who aren't um, really familiar, the, in the Mytilian affair, the same thing almost happened as with Milos. The Athenians decided to destroy a city, and then they changed their mind um, and suspenseful in Thucydides. Um, so in the play, back to the world of the play, um, after this deep sing uh, system of songs between the chorus and Hecuba, it gets interrupted by the arrival of Talthybius, who's bringing a new set of news. Hecuba, you know me from my many journeys to and fro as herald between the Achaean army and Troy. I was no stranger to you, lady, even before. I, Talthybius, now sent with a fresh message. Ah, kind friends, it has come. What I so long have dreaded. The lot has decided your fates already, if that was what you feared. Ah, me. What city did you say? Thessalian, Phythian, or Cadmian? Each warrior took his prize in turn. You were not all at once assigned. To whom has the lot assigned us severally? Which of us Trojan women does a happy fortune await? I know, but ask your questions separately, not all at once. Then tell me, whose prize is my daughter, hapless Cassandra? King Agamemnon has chosen her out for himself. To be the slave girl of his Spartan wife. Ah, oh, me. No, to share with him his stealthy love. What? Phoebus's virgin priestess, to whom the god with golden locks granted the gift of living unwed. The dart of love has pierced his heart, love for the frenzied maid. Daughter. Cast from you the sacred keys, and from your body tear the holy bees that drape you in their folds. Why? Is it not an honor that she should win our monarch's love? What have you done to her whom recently you took from me, my child? Do you mean Polyxena, or whom do you inquire about? Yes, that one. To whom has the lot assigned her? To minister at Achilles' tomb has been appointed her. Woe is me, I the mother of a dead man's slave. What custom, what ordinance is this among Helene's friend? Count your daughter happy, it, it is well with her. What wild words are these? Please tell me, is she still alive? Her fate is one that sets her free from pains. And what of the wife of Hector, skilled in arms, sad Andromache? Declare her fate. She too was, cho was a chosen prize. Achilles' son took her. As for me, whose hair is white with age, who need to hold a staff to be to me a third foot, whose servant am I to be? Odysseus, king of Ithaca, has taken you to be his slave. Oh! Oh! Now smite the close shorn head, tear your cheeks with your nails. Ah, me, I have fallen as a slave to a foul, treacherous man, an enemy of justice, a monster of lawlessness, one that by his double tongue has made non philos to us all that once was friendly in his camp, changing this for that and that for this again. Oh, weep for me, you Trojan women. Lost and ill-fated, ah, woe a victim to a most unhappy lot. Your fate, royal mistress, now you know. But for me, what Helene or Achaean is master of my destiny? Go, servants, and bring Cassandra forth to me here at once, that I may place her in our captain's hand, and then conduct to the rest of the chiefs the captives each has had assigned. Huh. What is the blaze of torches there within? What are they doing? Are they firing the chambers because they must leave this land and be carried away to Argos? Are they setting themselves aflame in their longing for death? 
Truly, the three bear their troubles in case like this with a stiff neck. Open up, lest their deed, which suits them well, but is hateful to the Achaeans, bring blame on me. It is not that they are setting anything ablaze, but my child Cassandra, frenzied maid, comes rushing wildly here. Bring the light, uplift and show its flame. I am doing the God's service. See, see, making his holy place to glow with tapers bright. Oh, Hymen, Lord of marriage. Blessed is the bridegroom, blessed am I also, soon to wed a princely Lord in Argos. Hail Hymen, Lord of marriage. Since you, mother, are busied with tears and lamentations in your mourning for my father's death and for our country, dear, I, at my own nuptials, am making this torch to blaze and show its light, giving to you, O Hymen, giving, O Hectate, a light at the girl's wedding as the custom is. Nimbly lift the foot. Lead the dance on high with cries of joy, as if to greet my father's happiest fate. The dance is sacred. Come, Phoebus, now, for it is in your temple among the bay trees that I minister. Hail, Hymen, god of marriage. Hymen, hail, dance, mother, and laugh. Link your steps with me and circle in the most philost measure. Now here, now there. Salute the bride on her wedding day with happy hymns and cries. Come, you maids of Phrygia in fair raiment, sing my marriage with the husband fate ordains that I should wed. Hold your fronting maiden, royal mistress, lest with nimble foot she rush to the Argive army. You god of fire, it is yours to light the bridal torch for men, but piteous is the flame you kindle here, beyond my blackest expectation. Ah, my child, how little did I ever dream that such would be your marriage, a captive and of Argos too. Give up the torch to me. You do not bear its blaze aright in your wild frantic course, nor have your afflictions left you in your sober senses but still you are as frantic as before. Take in those torches, Trojan friends, and for her wedding madrigals, weep your tears instead. Oh, mother, crown my head with victor's wreaths, rejoice in my royal match. Lead me, and if you find me unwilling at all, thrust me there by force. For if Loxias is indeed a prophet, Agamemnon, that famous king of the Achaeans, will find in me a bride more vexatious than Helen. For I will slay him and lay waste to his home to avenge my father's and my brother's death. But let that go, I will not sing of that axe which shall sever my neck and the necks of others, or of the ordeals ending in a mother's death, which my marriage shall cause nor of the overthrow of Atreus's house. But I, for all my frenzy, will so far rise above my frantic fit that I will prove this city happier far than those Achaeans, who for the sake of one woman and one passion have lost a countless army in hunting Helen. Their captain too, whom many men call wise, has lost for what he hated most, what he most prized, yielding to his brother for a woman's sake, and she was willing and not taken by force, the joy he had of his Philae's children in his home. For from the day that they landed on Scamander's strand, their doom began, not for loss of stolen frontier, nor yet for fatherland with high towers. Whomever Ares took, they never saw their children again, nor were they shrouded for the tomb by hand of wife, but in a foreign land they lie. At home, the case was still the same. Wives were dying widows. Parents were left childless in their homes, having reared their sons for others. 
and none is left to make libations of blood upon the ground before their tombs. Truly, the army is worthy of this praise. One had better keep silent about things that are disgraceful. May song not become for me a singer who hymns evils. But the Trojans were dying. First for their fatherland, fairest fame to win. Whomever the sword took, all these found friends to bear their corpses home and were laid to rest in the embrace of their native land. Their funeral rites all duly paid by duteous hands. And all such Phrygians as escaped the warrior's death lived always day by day with wife and children by them, joys the Achaeans had left behind. As for Hector and his griefs, here how the case stands. He is dead and gone, but still his fame remains as bravest of the brave. And this was a result of the Achaeans coming. For had they remained at home, his worth would have gone unnoticed. And Paris married the daughter of Zeus. Whereas had he never done so, the alliance he made in his family would have been forgotten. Whoever is wise should fly from making war. But if he come to this, a noble death will garland his city with glory, a coward's end with bad Cleos. Therefore, mother, you should not pity your country or my bed, for this my marriage will destroy those who you and I most hate. As you laugh sweetly at the bad things that are happening to you, you sing and dance and so a song and dance that you will show are not clear, maybe. Had not Apollo turned your wits to Bacchic revelry, you would not for nothing have sent my chiefs with such ominous predictions forth on their way. But after all, these lofty minds, reputed wise, are nothing better than those that are held as nothing. For that mighty king of all Hellas, Philo's son of Atreus, has yielded to a passion for this mad maiden of all others. Though I am poor enough, yet would I never have chosen such a wife as this. As for you, since your senses are not whole, I give your taunts against Argos and your praise of Troy to the winds to carry away. Follow me now to the ships to grace the wedding of our chief, and you too follow whenever the son of Laertes demands your presence, for you will serve a mistress most moderate, as all declare who came to Ilion. A clever one, this servant. Why is it heralds hold the name they do? All men unite in hating with one common hate the lackeys of kings or cities. You say my mother shall come to the halls of Odysseus. Where then are Apollo's words so clear to me in their interpretation, which declare that she shall die here? What else remains I will not taunt her with. Unhappy Odysseus, he does not know the suffering that await him, or how these ills I and my Phrygians endure shall one day seem to him precious as gold. For beyond the ten long years spent at Troy, he shall drag out another ten and then come to his country all alone, where dreadful Charybdis lurks in a narrow channel between the rocks past Cyclops, the savage shepherd and Ligurian Circe who turns men to swine, shipwrecked often among the sea salt wave, longing to eat the lotus and the sacred cattle of the sun, whose flesh shall utter in the days to come a human voice bitter to Odysseus. In brief, he shall descend alive to Hades, and though he shall escape the water's flood, yet shall he find a thousand troubles in his country when he arrives. Enough. Why do I recount the troubles of Odysseus? Lead on at once that I may wed my husband for his home in Hades' halls. Base you are, and basely you shall be buried. In the dead of night, when day is done, you captain of that army of Danaeans who think so proudly of your fortune. Yes, 
and in the rocky chasm with its flood of wintry waters shall give my corpse cast forth in nakedness to wild beasts to make their meal upon. Near my husband's tomb, I, Apollo servant, O oh, garlands of that God most dear to me. Farewell, you mystic symbols. I here resign your feasts, my joy in days gone by. Go, I tear you from my body, that while yet mine honour is intact, I may give them to the rushing winds to waft to you, my prince of prophecy. Where is that general's ship? Where must I go to take my place there? Lose no further time in watching for a favouring breeze to fill your sails. Doomed as you are to carry from this land one of the three avenging spirits. Fare you well, mother. Dry your tears. Oh, dear country. My brothers below the earth and my own father, it will not be long before you welcome me. Victory shall crown my advent among the dead, where I have overthrown the home of our destroyers, the house of the sons of Atreus. After this scene, Cassandra leaves. Hecuba asks the chorus to leave as well and then tells her own story. The chorus, though, sings in lyric mourning for Troy, recounting the entry of the wooden horse. Then Andromache arrives. She's destined to join Achilles' son, Neoptolemus. She mourns with Hecuba, Hecuba and echoes the chorus in repeatedly attributing their sufferings to Athena. She wishes she had died and says she will not be married again. And then we move on to the next scene. I never yet have set foot on a ship's deck, though I have seen such things in pictures and know of them from hearsay. Now sailors, if there comes a storm of moderate force, are all eagerness to save themselves by toil. One stands at the tiller, another sets himself to work the sheets. A third, meanwhile, is bailing out the ship. But if tempestuous sea arise to overwhelm them, they yield to fortune and commit themselves to the driving billows. Even so, I, by reason of my countless troubles, am speechless and forbear to say a word. For this surge of misery from the gods is too strong for me. Cease, my Philae child, to speak of Hector's fate. No tears of yours can save him. Honour your present master, offering your conduct as the sweet bait to win him. If you do this, you will cheer your friends as well as yourself, and you shall rear my Hector's child to lend stout aid to Ilion, that so your children in the aftertime may build her up again, and our city yet be established. But our talk must take a different turn. Who is this Achaean servant I see coming here again, sent to tell us of some new design? You that once were the wife of Hector, Bravest of the Phrygians, do not hate me, for I am not a willing messenger. The Danaeans and son of Pelops both command- What is it? Your prelude bodes evil news. It is decreed your son is. How can I tell my news? Surely not to have a different master from me. None of all Achaea's chiefs shall ever lord it over him. Is it their will to leave him here, a remnant of Phrygia's race? I know no words to break the bad news lightly to you. I thank you for your scruples, unless indeed you have good news to tell. They mean to slay your son. There is my hateful message to you. Oh, oh me, this is worse tidings than my forced marriage. So spoke Odysseus to the assembled Helens and his word prevails. Oh, once again, alas, there is no measure in the woes I suffer. He said they should not rear such a son of a noble father. May such counsels prevail against children of his. He must be thrown from Troy's battlements. Let it be so, and you will appear the more wise. Do not cling to him, but bear your sorrows nobly. Nor in your weakness think that you are strong, for nowhere do you have any help. Consider this you must. 
Your husband and your city are no more. So you are in our power. And I alone am match enough for one woman. Therefore, I would not see you bent on strife or any course to bring you shame or hate, nor would I hear you rashly curse the Achaeans. For if you say anything, to anger the army, this child will find no burial nor pity either. But if you hold your peace and with composure take your fate, you will not leave his corpse unburied and you yourself will find more favor with the Achaeans. My dearest, my own sweet child and most highly honored, your death the foe demands. You must leave your wretched mother. Your father's nobility, the salvation of others, proves your destruction. To you, your father's valor has proved no gift. Oh, my unlucky bed and marriage that brought me once to Hector's home, hoping to be the mother of a son that should be king over Asia's fruitful field instead of serving as a victim to the Danaeans. Do you weep, my child? Do you know your hapless faith? Why, why clutch me with your hands and to my garment cling, nestling like a tender chick beneath my wing? Hector will not rise from the earth and come gripping his famous spear to bring you salvation. No kinsman of your father appears, nor might of Phrygian hosts. One dreadful headlong leap from the dizzy height and you will dash your life out with none to pity you. Oh, to clasp your tender limbs, a mother's fondest joy to breathe your fragrant breath. In vain it seems these breasts did suckle you wrapped in your swaddling clothes all for nothing. I used to toil and wear myself away. Kiss your mother now for the last time nestle to her that bore you. Twine your arms about my neck and join your lips to mine. Oh you Helene's cunning to devise new forms of cruelty. Why slay this child responsible for no wrong? You Daughter of Tyndarius, you are no child of Zeus, but I say you were born of many a father, first some evil demon, next of envy, then of murder and of death and every horror that the earth breeds, that Zeus was never a father of yours, I do boldly assert, bane as you have been to many a Helene and barbarian too, destruction catch you. Those fair eyes of yours have brought a shameful ruin on the fields of glorious Troy. Take the child and bear him hence, hurl him down if you wish, then feast upon his flesh. It is the God's will we perish, and I cannot ward the deadly stroke from my child. Hide me in my misery. Cast me into the ship's hold, for it is to a fair wedding I am going now that I have lost my child. Unhappy Troy, you have lost countless men for the sake of one woman and her hateful bed. Come, child. Leave fond embracing of your woeful mother and mount the high coronal of your ancestral towers, there to draw your parting breath as is ordained. Take him away. His should the duty be to do such herald's work whose heart knows no pity and who loves ruthlessness more than my soul does. Oh, child, son of my hapless boy, an unjust fate robs me and your mother of your life. What am I suffering? What can I do for you, luckless one? For you I strike upon my head and beat my breast, my only gift, for that is in my power. Woe for my city. Woe for you. What sorrow do we not have? What is wanting now to our utter and immediate ruin? So this moment of losing the life of Astyanax, the future of Troy, it's a powerful one in Greek myth that shows up in multiple places. We have it from early Greek art and vase paintings. Um, and it's contemplated as well in the Iliad where we get two really moving speeches by Andromache, where she imagines a future for her son, both before the death of Hector and after. Robin, what do you think it is about this particular moment that caught the ancient audience's attention? 
Why do they keep returning to a Steiners? Well, just the, you know, the child is always going to be the hope for the future. And when as bleak as things seem to them at that moment, they still have that one last boy, the only son of Hector, who presumably they would hope could you know, rebuild the city at some point, not necessarily take revenge as the Greeks fear, but, but would, would have some kind of physical attachment to that, to that great Hector that they had as their champion before. He's, he's unspoiled as well. Right, everything else has been ruined, but it's very hard to 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 to, to ruin a child of that age. Yeah, I mean this, um, and you know, as sort of an emotional climax of the play, it comes right here, which means we're in store for more. And yeah. of course, returns to lament the war before the entrance of Menelaus. Um, and Euripides seems to have a thing with going back to Menelaus. Um, <laughs> he announces that he didn't come to the siege to get his wife back, but to punish a man who offended his household. He announces that he will take Helen home and sacrifice her there. Hecuba warns, uh, warns him not to see her. Don't even look at Helen because she'll bewitch him, but oh, too late. Helen appears and tells the story of the judgment of Paris, one that as Robin told us was talked about probably in that earlier play about Alexandros. She tells him that he, she left unwillingly with a man aided by a goddess. She was unwilling to go with Paris and unwilling too to marry Deophobus afterwards. We get Hecuba here claiming that Helen is lying about being forced and that she was greedy. The scene ends with Menelaus dragging Helen to the ship, another image that appears on base paintings, still planning on killing her. But Hecuba warns him that there's no lover who does not love forever. The chorus laments the temples and rites of Troy, which will be observed no longer alongside their own fates as war booty, wishing in turn for the ruin of the Greek feet, fleet uh, before the next scene begins. Oh me, ah uh, me, new troubles fall on my country to take the place of those that are still are fresh. Behold your hapless wives of Troy, the corpse of Astyanax, whom the Danians have cruelly slain by hurling him from the battlements. Hecuba, one ship alone delays its plashing oars, and it is soon to sail to the shores of Phthia, freighted with the remnant of the spoils of Achilles' son. For Neoptolemus is already out at sea, having heard that new calamities have befallen Peleus. For Acastos, son of Peleus, has banished him from the realm. Therefore he is gone, not having the pleasure of delaying. And with him goes Andromache, who drew many tears from me when she set out from the land, wailing her country and crying her farewell to Hector's tomb. And she begged her master leave to bury this poor dead child of Hector, who breathed out his suke when hurled from the turrets entreating too that he would not carry this shield, the terror of the Achaeans, this shield with plates of brass with which his father would gird himself to the homes of Peleus or to the same bridal bower where she, Andromache, the mother of this corpse, would be wed, a bitter sight to her. But let her bury the child in it instead of in a coffin of cedar or a tomb of stone. And to your hands commit the corpse that you may deck it with robes and garlands as best you can with your present means. For she is far away and her master's haste prevented her from making funeral rites the child herself. So we when you have arranged the corpse, will heap the earth above and set upon it a spear, but do you with your best speed perform your allotted task? One toil, however, I have already spared you, for I crossed Scamander's stream and bathed the corpse and cleansed its wounds. But now I will go to dig a grave for him, that our united efforts, shortening our task, may speed our ship towards home. Place the shield upon the ground, Hector's shield, so deftly rounded, a piteous sight, and not Philon for me to see. Oh, you Achaeans, more reason have you to boast of your prowess than of your friends. Why have you in terror of this child been guilty of a murder never matched before? Did you fear that someday he would rear again the fallen walls of Troy? 
It seems then you were nothing after all, when, though Hector's fortunes in the war were prosperous and he had 10,000 other arms to back him, we still were daily overmatched. And yet, now that our city is taken and every Phrygian slain, you fear a tender child like this. I do not commend the fear of one who fears, but never yet have reasoned out the cause. Ah, most philos, yours is a piteous death indeed. If you had died for your city when you have tasted of the sweets of manhood, of marriage and of godlike tyranny over others, then were you blessed, if anything here is blessed. But now, once again seeing and recognizing with your soul, you know them no more, my child, and have no joy of them, though heir to all. Ah. Poor child, how sadly have your own father's walls, those towers that Loxias reared, shorn from your head the locks your mother fondled and so often caressed, from which through fractured bones the face of murder grins. Briefly to dismiss my shocking theme. Oh, Han. How sweet the likeness you retain of his father. And yet you lie limp in your sockets before me. Philon mouth, so often full of words of pride. Death has closed you and you have not kept the promise you made. When nestling in my robe, ah, mother, many a lock of hair I will cut off for you, and to your tomb will lead my troops of friends, taking a fond farewell of you. But now, I am not to be buried by you, but you, the younger one, a wretched corpse, are honoured with funeral rites by me on whom old age has come without city and without children. Ah me, those kisses numberless, the nurture that I gave to you, those sleepless nights, they all are lost. What shall the bard inscribe upon your tomb about you? Argives once for fear of him slew this child. Foul shame should that inscription be to Hellas. O oh, child, though you have no part in all your father's wealth, yet shall you have his brazen shield in which to be honoured with burial rites. Ah, shield that kept safe the comely arm of Hector. Now have you lost your most noble keeper? How fair upon your handle lies his imprint and on the rim that circles round are marks of sweat that trickled often from Hector's brow as he pressed it against his beard in the ordeal's battle. Come, bring forth from such store as you have adornment for this hapless dead, for the demon gives no chance now for lovely offerings. Yet of such as I possess, you shall receive these gifts. He is a foolish mortal who thinks his luck secure and so rejoices. For fortune, like a madman in her moods, springs towards this man, then towards that. And no one ever experiences the same unchanging luck. Look, all is ready and they are bringing at your bidding from the spoils of Troy a dormant to put upon the dead. Ah, my child. It is not as victor over your comrades with horse or bow, customs Troy honours, without pursuing them to excess, that Hector's mother decks you now with ornaments from the store that once was yours. Though now Helen, whom the gods abhor, has bereft you of your own, yes, and robbed you of your life and caused your house to perish root and branch. Whoa. Thrice woe, my heart is touched, and you the cause, my mighty lord of the city in days now past. About your body now I swathe this Phrygian robe of honour, 
which should have clad you on your marriage day, wedded to the noblest of Asia's daughters. You too, Philon, shield of Hector, victorious parent of countless triumphs past, accept your crown, for though you share the dead child's tomb, dead cannot touch you, for you merit honours far beyond those arms that Sophos, Caicos, Odysseus won. Alas, alas, you, O oh child, shall earth take to her breast a cause for bitter weeping. Mourn you, mother. Alas! Wail for the dead. Woe is me! Woe indeed for your unending sorrow. Your wounds in part I will bind up with bandages, a wretched healer in name alone, without reality. But for the rest your father must look to that among the dead. Smite, oh smite upon your head with frequent blow of hand. Woe is me! My kind good friends. Speak out, Hecuba, the word that was on your lips. It seems the only things that heaven concerns itself about are my ordeals and Troy hateful in their eyes above all other cities. In vain did we sacrifice to them. But if the God had not caught us in his grip and plunged us headlong beneath the earth, we should have been non-appearing and not ever hymned in muses songs, furnishing to bards of after days a subject for their minstrelsy. Though, bury now in his poor tomb the dead, wreathed all duly as befits a corpse. And yet I think it makes little difference to the dead if they get a gorgeous funeral but this is a cause of idle pride to the living. Alas, for your unhappy mother, whoever your corpse has closed the high hopes of her life, born of noble stock, counted most happy in your lot. Ah, what a dinos death is yours. Huh? Who are those I see on yonder pin pinnacles darting to and fro with flaming torches in their hands? Some new calamity will soon alight on Troy. You captains whose allotted task is to fire this town of Priam, to you I speak. No longer preserve the firebrand idle in your hands, but launch the flame that when we have destroyed the city of Ilion, we may set forth in gladness on our homeward voyage from Troy. And you, you sons of Troy, to let my orders take at once a double form, start for the Achaean ships for your departure from the land as soon as the leaders of the army blow loud and clear upon the trumpet. And you, unhappy gray-haired lady, follow, for here come servants from Odysseus to fetch you, for to him you are assigned by lot to be a slave far from your country. Ah, oh, woe is me. This surely is the last, the utmost limit of all my sorrows. I go forth from my land, my city is ablaze with flame. Yet you aged foot, make one painful struggle to haste, that I may say a farewell to this wretched town. O oh, Troy, that before had such a grand career among barbarian towns, soon will I be bereft of that splendid name. They are burning you and leading us even now from our land to slavery. Oh, gods, yet why do I call on the gods? They did not hearken ever before to our call. Come, let us rush into the flames, for to die with my country in its blazing ruin would be a noble death for me. Your sorrows drive you frantic, poor lady. Go, lead her away, make no delay for you must deliver her into the hand of Odysseus, conveying to him his prize. Woe, oh, woe, son of Kronos, prince of Phrygia, father of our race, do you behold such things we suffer now, unworthy of the stock of the Dedeans? He sees them, but our mighty city is a city no more, and Troy's day is done. Woe, oh, woe, Ilion is ablaze. The homes of Pergamos and its towering walls are now one sheet of flame. As the smoke soars on wings to heaven, so sinks our city onto the ground before the spear. With furious haste, both fire and enemy spear devour each house. Oh, earth, 
nourisher of my children. Ah, uh, ah. Uh, Hearken, my children, hear your mother's voice. You are calling on the dead with voice of lamentation. Yes, as I stretch my aged limbs upon the ground and beat upon the earth with both my hands. I follow you and kneel, invoking from the netherworld my hapless husband. I am being dragged and hurried away. The sorrow, the sorrow of that cry. To dwell beneath a master's roof. From my own country. Woe is me, O oh, Priam, Priam, slain, unburied, without Philos. Nothing do you know of my disaster. No, for over his eyes black death has drawn his pall, a pure man slain by the impure. Woe for the temples of the gods and for the Philae city. Ah, uh, ah. Uh, Murderous flame and enemy spear are now your lot. Soon will you tumble to your own filler soil and be forgotten. And the dust, mounting to heaven on wings like smoke, will rob me of the sight of my home. The name of my country will pass into obscurity. All is scattered far and white, and hapless Troy has ceased to be. Did you know? Did you hear? Yes, it was the crash of the citadel. A shock. A shock will overwhelm our city utterly. Oh, woe is me! Trembling, quaking limbs support my footsteps away to face the day that begins your slavery. Woe for our un unhappy town. Pick up your step and head for the oared ships of the Achaeans. So just as the play begins with the deep sequence of songs and lamentation, it ends with a pretty long sequence as well. Robin, can you tell us a little bit about what you think was happening with what is called the exodus with this ending of the play? It, it's a remarkable scene in, in a lot of different ways. Um, for one, it's just, it's just relentless. I mean, the whole play is relentless. It, you know, the play is extraordinary in the sense that nothing happens in the entire play. But the only thing that actually happens is 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 an Cyanax dying, right? Other than that, it's people reacting to, to things that have already happened. Um, a couple, a couple, I'll stress four things here. One is the the staging, which is very very difficult to to see exactly what's going on. But at one point, um, the chorus about in the middle of the scene uh, says, "Look up on the citadel. There's a bunch of guys with torches." And if the the, the Scane building uh, at the back of the acting area is um, supposed to represent uh, the walls of Troy, that would suggest that there are a bunch of mute extras now on top of that building with torches, which, and the play began with the gods up there. And visually to, uh, to me, I think that would be a, a very powerful um, suggestion that the Greeks at this point uh, think that they're gods, that they kind of, that they, they now believe they have the capacity to, to, to grant and, to, and take away life as if there were no repercussions for what they were doing, uh, which of course is completely wrong. We know that from what the gods themselves had said at the beginning of the play. So I think that you would have that kind of, and Euripides like to have these tableaus at the beginning and ending of plays, which are a bit similar this way. Um, second, um, there's only two actors on stage at the end. Uh, Euripides has three available and the, the scene begins with that kind of, I think it's kind of a cheap excuse um, why Andromache is not there, right? So while we had, uh, Neoptolemus was in a big hurry to leave and she said, oh, could you take care of the burial of a Cyanax for me? Which doesn't sound like something a Cyanax <laughs> would say is take care of my son's burial for me. And so that, I think it's just, that's a way of motivating that the final focus is on Helen, Hecuba herself. It has to be complete in Hecuba. And Hecuba seems to be one of those we, these characters that Euripides had kind of a deep personal connection to for one reason or another, um, a bit like Sophocles with Oedipus. Um, uh, she got, she, she'd already had her own play <laughs> uh, about uh, eight years before that, the play called Hecuba, which in my view is about the darkest thing that Euripides wrote. I think the only play in Greek tragedy, which is as dark as that, is probably Sophocles' Electra, um, in which she, Hecuba finally snaps 
after her daughter Polyxena, who's mentioned in this play, is sacrificed to Achilles. And then her last surviving son, Polydor Polydorus, uh, is murdered by the man that they'd entr entrusted him for safekeeping during the war. And so she basically plots to blind and murder the sons of the man who had killed her last remaining son. And the play, that play ends with this horrific kind of crescendo of hatred, which in a final prophecy that she will die after having been turned into a dog climbing the top of the mast of, of Odysseus's ship and which will fall off into the, into the ocean. And there's a hint of that in this play where Cassandra is confused by this idea that it, she, will, she will die in basically Odysseus's house. She said, but that's not what I was told. So, so Hecuba for, for Euripides seems to have been almost the, the quintessence of what a tragic figure could be. Somebody who has lost absolutely everything. Oh. Can you talk a little bit more about Euripides' use of women for myth? Because I think, you know, Sophocles has a few, right, as you mentioned, but he has an Andromache, a, a Helen, um, and, you know, Iphigenia shows up a few times, and Helen shows up multiple times. What do you make of that uh, choice or habit of Euripides? Yeah, it's, 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 it's especially interesting given that uh, the joke started by Aristophanes was that, er that, was that Euripides was a bit of a misogynist. And that's one of those things which entered into the ancient biography, which is really, really hard to get out. Um, he certainly seemed to be much more interested in female characters than, than Sophocles. But again, we have two and a half times as many plays by Euripides uh, than we do of Sophocles. So that's a question of, of, of just an accident of history there. One thing about a lot of these plays is that, is that a number of them are from the last 15 or so years of the century. Um, and uh, I once heard a talk by, uh, by uh, Jeff Anderson of Boston University in which he, su he suggested that um, the reason for all these, these female-based plays in the, during the second half of the uh, Peloponnesian War is that the men had screwed stuff up so badly that, that it was better to write plays about women doing things. Uh, that's a gross oversimplification of what his argument was. But I think there's, there's probably something to that. But, but the Euripides, Certainly, one of the reasons he's more appealing to um, to modern audiences than his than the other uh, two of the big three is that he's much more interested in psychology, right? He's much more interested in why people act, and um, I think probably he sensed that that the women were a much uh, more fertile um, way of communicating those, those interests. So early in the discussion, um, you were talking about the theme of bad decisions and, you know, sort of you reading back into it now with the psychological interests of Euripides and thinking about years of being in a city, men going off to that war and then observing the domestic suffering. Um, do you think a lot of this theme of bad decisions is connected to what's going on politically in um, Athens or is it just more general reflection on yeah, wow. and as Joel, as you yourself had said early uh, in, in, the, in the show, that, that things have been going pretty well for the Athenians. I mean, they, they had about six years of peace with Sparta, which was an uneasy peace. There were still minor skirmishes and proxy wars going on. Um, but um, the Athenians were a very restless people. Um, and uh, uh, so they kept trying to kind of push the envelope in terms of, in terms of their, their, their realm of authority, which resulted in the destruction of Milos the year before, which and was leading to the Sicilian expedition, um, which was about to launch a couple of months after this play. And uh, the decision to invade Sicily was one of the most bizarre things I think any advanced state had ever done, uh, which is in the middle of a, of a, of a, of a two decade at that point long war to go start another one. And Sicily, you know, Sic Sicily for them is like China for us in terms of like how long it takes to get there. I mean, it's absolutely nuts. So that that scene with, with Helen and Menelaus, I think one of the functions of that is to kind of evoke how insane debates had become uh, in Athens at that point, where the, the, the rhetoric that Helen uses about, you should be glad that I brought about the Trojan War because now the Trojans have been destroyed and they're no longer a threat to Greece. 
So I did you a favor. It's a little bit like some of the logic that Alcibiades was using in the debate over the Sicilian expedition. Now I gotta stress that the debate over the Sicilian expedition would have taken place a month or two before this play was produced and therefore could not have directly affected the content of those speeches. But again, it's the, the sorts of things that were going on. Now with bad decision, you, know, you think about, you know, what is Euripides trying to do and say with this trilogy as a whole? Of course, you never want to boil it down to too simple a message, but this theme of bad decision seems to kind of percolate all the way through. So what is he saying? Well, one, one of the geniuses about use, uh, one of the genius aspects of, of using myth to address contemporary issues in the theater is that you can basically have it work in two or three different directions. Okay, so step taking a step back, um, you know the great horror for the, I think for the ancient most places in the ancient Mediterranean was the destruction of your own city. And in some ways, that's why the destruction of Troy has a kind of is, is very much like the fall of man in the Garden of Eden in, in the biblical tradition. Right, it's the worst thing you can possibly imagine. In the decade after the sack of Athens by the Persians in 490, there was an explosion of vase paintings depicting the sack of Troy in Athens. And so it's very clear from this that the Athenians started to think of themselves as being analogous to the experience of the Trojans that way. And I think that kind of percolates through a lot of this, the, the plays in which the the Trojan War um, is, be, is, is the source of the story here. So, so you think about this, that the, the Athenians can be, basically see themselves both as the Trojans as, and as the Greeks in this play. So it's both their fear, what could happen to us, that is our city could get destroyed by the Spartans, but it's also perhaps the guilt that he's, that Euripides is trying to uh, kind of instill in them about like, why are we doing these things? <laughs> I really like that you mentioned the destruction of Athens in um, 480, um, because at this point, the performance of this play, that experience, which had to be horrifying, is 65 years in the past. So m most of the audience would have only heard of it, but most of the audience would have been there for the plague in 430, 429, yep. and how it kept coming back. And so, you know, I think we really can think about an audience that has been traumatized in different ways. Yet in a culture that's bouncing back to a height of power and then just pushing it, as Robin says. So I think we have sort of an amazing sort of petri dish for exploring human limitations and excess. Uh, and that's why it's fascinating to see the experience of the characters. So I'd like to talk to some of the actors right now about um, their experiences. I think we, ha we have to start with Hecuba because she's such a central part of the play. Um, Eunice, I, I mean, Catherine Hepburn got to be Hecuba, right? I mean, and, and in this play, like she's the beginning and she's the end. When you came to this play and you started reading Hecuba, what, what went through your mind? But it, I think it is the size of it, you know? And I mean, I, I can identify with Karen, uh, you know, um, th that is something, you know, we can't always just turn over and, turn the other cheek and be kind and gentle, um, though we might try to be and know we should be. Um, it, it is just that when there's nothing, it, you've lost everything. And I, mean, I, and I loved it there, what you were saying, Robin, because I think as a modern audience, you know, you go to these plays and you, well, you just think, oh, for goodness sake, you know, I mean, this is just... How can you cope with this, you know, um, if you especially don't know all the background? But, but, I, but I really liked what you said about, could this happen to me? You know, if you, if you sat in, so therefore seeing Hecuba from um, a personal point of view as opposed to Hecuba's point of view. Um, if you've lost, absolutely lost everything. You know, there's there's been a fire of your house, and you've lost family and pets and photographs, everything that was you that you've lost. Um, and it's just that sort of emptiness, really. I think 
but still a steal. Be nice to him and then you'll be able to get round and we'll build it. There's still hope. There's this, still hope all through that. There's something of sort of the, the, the strength of let's say an Aeschylean Clytemnestra, but with a greater depth to get from Euripides in that portrayal of, uh, mm. of, of Hecuba. And I mean, just, I mean, the emotional range expressed by the characters in this play is just beyond, um, beyond some of those earlier plays. So Tabitha um, and Dramaki. I mean, honestly, I have to say that one of the few times I've actually wept reading ancient Greek is reading um, her final speech about her son in the Iliad. I mean, it's just so moving. And as a character, this relationship, I mean, it could just be a stereotype. But you brought some, I mean, real depth to the movements through our lines. Um, what was it like to have to face being Andromache at that moment? Well, I thought a lot about what you said earlier about decisions. And that was really prevalent in my mind about just the idea that the decision that someone else who has a certain amount of power, whatever that might be over, that decision that they make can ripple out so far generations to people that you know have no idea that a decision is even being made and listening to those lines that uh the the messenger uh had about you know you're a woman you're all of these things i could very easily take you it just went back to that remembrance of oh i had nothing to do with this and you know i i'm completely helpless in this circumstance to help you know, another even more innocent thing that belongs to me, person that belongs to me. And as I've said in times past, I always relate this to things that are happening today. And so, of course, you know, it was pretty fresh. It, it, it really was. I mean, just the, the, the level of loss, the thought of children. Um, I'm going to make this a little harder when we get back to tell Phibius. But before we get there, um, Evie, everyone knows Cassandra's crazy. You played her solid and sober. What was your approach going um, into the mind of Cassandra? No, that's really interesting. I think, um, yeah, she's, she's, she's a fascinating character. And I suppose as an actor, the idea that you'd play mad, trying to play mad is, I think like the worst, other than potentially trying to play drunk, um, one of the worst traps that you can fall into, which I think offers you this really, um, this really exciting kind of problem, really, that you absolutely have to look at your character as completely sane, which in Cassandra's case, I think raises some really fascinating questions. She is obviously seeing with total clarity. She's distinct from everyone else in, in the play in that she, she she knows, she sees the truth and that truth is overwhelming. So I think the idea of, um, the, the idea of really, uh, you know, kind of le leaning into that, um, leaning into that clarity and that knowledge and that complete self-assurance in what you know to be true. And it was interesting, Eunice saying that Hecuba always has hope, I suppose in, in that clear knowledge of what your future holds, hope becomes something that that is maybe no longer useful. It seems like what she's ha having to do is kind of pull and twist these narratives into something positive. Yes, we're dying. Yes, our country is crushed. Yes, you know, your children are dead, but they died with pride. They died with family. They were buried here in our soil. Um, I think it's, it's very moving. Um, okay. I, I like I've, the way you hit some of the lines. One of my favorite parts of the this depiction of Cassandra in this play is when she says, I'm gonna be a more vexatious wife than Helen. I'm gonna kill him, right? Yeah. Like this yeah. really contrasts with the Cassandra of, um, of Aeschylus' Agamemnon, which is almost incomprehensible, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so, and that's what I like about your depiction is that Cassandra knows the truth. She's not yeah. crazy everybody else's perception that's a problem. And so it's a powerful choice. Totally. And imagine the reassurance of knowing that whatever wrong had been done, you're going to be the person that finally, you know, ends it, ends the curse of this house. Yeah. It's, it's, 
it is an incredible um it's an incredible thing yeah such a such a i mean just the most amazing writing no such a play. on the topic of perception i think the character in the play who presents either the least options or the most uh, in some ways um for room for a uh, room is telthibius and robert i can't help now when looking at telthibius of thinking like us border agents mm -hmm. right um and people who are in positions where they're just following orders um what were your thoughts in Telthibius as a character and the messages he had to deliver. Yeah, there's such delicious ambiguity in the language, isn't there? there there's such references to a, a stiff-necked stoicism that, that he both uh, seek, seems to seek to maintain for himself and certainly encourages for, for others to maintain, um, perhaps for their own good or for their dignity, uh, or perhaps for his own pragmatic success. But then he has at least a few eruptions of apparent mercy and I think we see that first with his evasion of telling the, the truth about Polixena. Uh, and, then, and then the stiff neck mode comes back. And, and then I think the, the moment with osteomics, the language, osteonics, I may be saying that wrong, but I think that, uh, I think that kind of breaks him. I think that breaks this kind of um, pragmatism that he's got, because from that point on, we see more mercy erupting through and more effort to make for example, the funeral rites viable. Um, I mean, I think as an actor, it, it's always good to show change <laughs> rather than just pick a note and, and, and sing that same note. Um, so for me, the goal was to try to show the places where his training and, and role in the world uh, was wearing thin on him and, and couldn't be sustained. Um, I'd love to dig into this this role in a really deep way with the director and really discover how to let that arc and that narrative shine through at the right moments. But it makes him, for me, an extremely interesting character, um, full of tensions, full of internal tension, I think. One of the things I've loved week to week is uh, listening to the actors talk about how they try to inhabit the characters and bring life and justification to them. Um, because I think often when we read these or teach them, we flatten out the characters. We don't let Talthibius be someone who actually has a story. Um, and that's part of this process is really enlightening to me um, because I think what you just said about Talthibius changing at that moment um, that he has to deliver the news about a Styanex, um, I don't know if I want to believe it's true because I, I really don't like Talthibius and what he does, but I'm now willing to go back and look at it hard. Right, and it's really something that you can you can bring back into it to breathe life into it. I think part of what's powerful about this play and many of those near Euripides's um, last few years is the way he makes all the characters sort of complicit um, members in these or cl complicit actors in terrible deeds. So last week when we were doing the Orestes, it's almost a farce in how they move from murder to plot to murder, and then at the end you can't even tell who's in charge. And this play as well, I mean it the agency is just sort of left out, right? Um, so as we sort of move to close again, you know, Robin, um, there's more to consider, right? About what, where the audience was and who was watching and the impact they had on them. Did they see themselves in Telthibius? Did they hear the complexity in Hecuba? You know, theater is always a, a multi-voiced enterprise and which is what's so remarkable about it. And there, you, can, you can't boil the audience down to a kind of monolithic block either. And the theater of Dionysus seems to be one of the places where the Athenians had to, basically had discussions with each other about what was happening through the agency of, of, of myth. Um, but the, the seating wasn't random and certain people sat in certain places. And, and one thing I would stress here, because this is a play about war, in which the Athenians had just done some pretty awful things in war is that the front row of the audience, the prohedria, what's called the prohedria, would have been the generals, the, basically generals and, 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 and the, the priests of the major cults. Um, and so um, whatever, 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 whatever message is being sent by, by the actors and the poet in the play is going to be received very, very loud and clear because they are right there in a way that the actors are speaking right to them. Um, in the audience there. It's, Maybe to an audience of all men, that's another matter. Yeah, it is. Uh, oh, and also, are they all Athenians? 
Um, so uh, Denai, uh, you've done a lot of performances before of Greek tragedy. Um, how, how does this genre or venue differ? Um, and what, you know, what did it bring that you didn't see before? And what are you missing in this experience? Well, uh, to be honest, uh, because uh, English is not my first language, I, uh, I had to focus rather on less significant things, you know, like accent and uh, not to miss my line. And I was a bit anxious as well. So I cannot um, uh, say that it was the same experience, you know, as <laughs> actually, you know, acting it in Greek. Uh, of course, but uh, no, for me, it was very, very interesting because um, the part of the chorus is usually one of the most uh, misunderstood parts of the, of the tragedy because, uh, okay, sometimes the, the chorus serves the part of um, give advice to the main characters or, uh, you know, trying to protect the main character or to trying to turn her to do the other thing that what she was supposed to do at first. But in this play, uh, what I really, really like um, was the, the fact that it's uh, the, the part of the chorus is almost identified, you know, the emotional uh, journey that those uh, women have is very similar to the main characters. Um, and uh, just by watching it now, you know, I, 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 I love the, um, I kind of realized for the first time the, the, um, the symbolism of uh, the, the disappearance of a whole nation. At the same time, when at the last scene you watch the the um, disappearance of the of the city itself, you know that it burns out and it disappears, and that I thought it was very very interesting for me uh, to to realize. But uh, yeah, I mean every uh, every uh, author uh, is very different, uh, um, and every experience is very very different. For example, if you have the chance to really perform in the in open space theater in Epidavros, for example, uh, I, I think this as an experience is so overwhelming, even more overwhelming than the text itself, especially if it's you know one of your first times. Um, so yeah, every time is very different, but this was great for me to really listen to you guys, really. I mean, one of the, one of the things about this, this context is that it really uh, allows you and forces you to think about the words um, and to, to think about how they sort of build off one another. Now, in, of course, when we're doing this, we select some words and not others. Um, Emma, I know you weren't directly uh, involved with selecting scenes this week. Um, but what do you think about the group of scenes we put together and how they represent the play? I think the the scenes that were selected this week, it this play is always for me, that's the play that really kicks you while you're down. Um, it's the play of, of just when you think you've lost everything, you're gonna lose a little bit more. And I think the scenes that we selected this week really rooted us in this kind of the false bottom of grief in that like you think you think you're at the bottom and oh no there's a secret bottom down here it can get worse um and really giving us the opportunity to have all of these moments of drop and drop and drop and to see who who these people are when the rug gets pulled out from under them you know over and over and over and for Hecuba it's this this strength and this fury and this like very expressive, open grief and anger and rage. And for Andromache, it's this like utter, utter loss. And for Talthibius, it's this ambiguity of are, are we discovering mercy from this character? Are we discovering empathy or are we discovering, uh, you know, I, as a, as a Jewish person, the kind of only following orders thing has a very personal resonance for me. And for my personal favorite in this play, we get Cassandra, who is this kind of blazing star in the middle of so much darkness and shadow. And she's not morally, you know, she's got her own moral ambiguity of this like intense, bitter joy, mm. this like vindictive joy at like, yes, I, yes, these are my circumstances. Yes, this is the life that I have been given, but I am gonna take what you have thrust upon me and I'm gonna choke you with it. Um, <laughs> Yeah, she's got she's got a special energy. The way the way you put it there, wait, it can get worse. Feels <laughs> like it could have been our motto since 2016, <laughs> <laughs> and maybe why these tragedies are uh, resounding so much for us. Um, before we close and say thank you to those who aren't 
on the screen. Um, Robin, you've been working with tragedy for a while. You are what we call an expert. Um, how has doing this uh, shifted sort of the way you think about tragic performance or the way we engage with tragedy? Uh, it's always, it's always good. It's always great to hear lines like these spoken by excellent actors who can bring to the lines the emotion that they really need. And so for that, I'm, I'm very, very grateful. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It's, it's moving. Next week, we're going to be moved again by a more individual tale in certain ways. But in Sophocles is Ajax. We'll meet at the same time. Um, before closing, I want to thank um, everybody involved. Robin, thank you for coming and joining us. All the actors, thank you as usual. Um, and just as the ancient stage had a whole bunch of unnamed crew building things, we have people who aren't on the screen who are making this possible. Um, John uh, Coyley is making posters that deserve a museum of their own, uh, but we also have the technical support in the background from Lana, Ollie Mabry, Janet, Ellen, Sarah, Keith DeStone, uh, Bettina Joy Van Guzman is hanging out with us every week. Greg Naj lurks. I'm happy he's here. Um, thank you all for being here. I hope the week is kind to you. Take care and we'll see you again next week.